I started a new series last week that I've entitled The Gods Must Be Crazy. And of course, many of you are familiar with that old movie, and the Coke bottle fell out of the sky and so on and so forth. And uh, as we go along, you'll understand more and more why I, why I have called this The Gods Must Be Crazy. But you know, whether we like it or not, we are in a time of great reformation. Now, a lot of people don't like it, but nevertheless, it's true. We can't escape it. The fact that you don't know about it doesn't mean it's not happening. And uh, Reformation is always turbulent, it's always difficult, because what it does is it questions uh, why we believe what we believe, and it also asks why we do what we do. And, and what it does is it confirms the possibility and actually suggests the probability that we have been toiling in, in futility, maybe for many years or generations. And uh, these are tough things to deal with. And so consequently, Reformation is always met with resistance. Now, it's met with resistance from within and from without. You know, we know that. You know, we lose friends without when we try to uh, in indulge ourselves in Reformation. But, you know, it's not the things that we that, that from without that are a real problem. As a pastor, I'm concerned with the, with the, uh, with the internal resistance that we all experience. Because uh, once, once you have... Uh, have uh, breach the wall, once you have, have gotten beyond the resistance within you, it's not going to make any difference what's said on the outside or, or how many of your friends decide to, decide to discard you or, or, you know, or call you, label you, call you names or whatever else. But as I said, you know, it's always a turbulent time and, uh, and we need to understand that. And, and we've, we've been talking about this. I mean, this is not something that started last Sunday or six weeks ago. This Reformation is something that really has developed a full head of steam in the last five years. And I've talked about it a lot. Arthur's talked about it. Caleb's talked a lot about it. And, and it has indeed cost us many of our old, peer, our old peers, you know, in terms of friendship and relationship. And that's no big deal to me. But it has also brought, you know, me into relationship with a, with a, a, a different <laughs> a group of people. Not a better group of people. The other, other people are all good people, but it's brought me into a relationship and fellowship with a different group of people uh, in, in which we, we are all able to flourish. You know, you, you flourish when you're, when you're able to be in a, in a group, uh, a, a, uh, even if it's just two or three, but when, it, when you're able to be with others who, who, who share the same sense of reformation in this case, you really have the opportunity to flourish. And of course, that's what I want for you. Uh, I'm not trying to shape uh, what you what you think or how you feel I always encourage you to please think for yourselves uh, And that's why I say I would be happy if other people would speak once in a while here I, It's not something this is not my pulpit. This is a pulpit. You know, this is a podium. We just use it for uh, to, to, to lay things on while we're speaking, but anyway um, But for most of us in this group uh, Reformation is about questioning and readjusting <clears throat> either our Catholic, our evangelical, or our fundamentalist uh, interpretations of Scripture. That's really what it's all about. And um, my, particular, uh, my particular approach to questioning and, uh, or to, what I want to say, to, uh, to, to re, to, yeah, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say, to, to, to exposing and, um, and readjusting some of these questionable scriptural interpretations. Now listen to me careful. My particular approach, and those of you that have been around here now long enough will know this, but is to actually uh, try to demonstrate that the scriptures themselves identify the error in the interpretation of themselves. Now if you were here when I talked about the mythology of the Old Testament several years, several months ago, you know, you know that that's what I did. I used the scripture to, to show that the scripture says that, that, that there's a mythological base to the scripture. Isn't that right? And so, and that's, you know, that's my personal approach as a pastor, you know, is to try to demonstrate from the scriptures that the scriptures themselves expose the error of their interpretations. Now, there are many others who are working, you know, these same issues through extra biblical um, sources, you know, things like the early, uh, the early writings of the early church fathers and, and maybe some rabbinical writings and, and uh, archaeological discoveries and other historical proofs. And, you know, and all of those are valid and justified in their usage. But for me, you know, as a pastor among non-theologians, and that's not a, a, a discrediting of you. I'm, when I speak of theologians, I'm speaking of the people who have, who have been through the seminaries and done all the, 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 the in-depth work that theologians do. <clears throat> 
and some of them come out, some of them don't uh, good, and some of them don't come out so well, you know. But anyway, but but for me, you know, uh, as a pastor uh, among non theologians, you know, um, how much greater is the influence, is the persuasive influence of Scripture? You know, if we can show that Scripture identifies the error of our interpretation of Scripture, how much greater an influence? Because isn't it some or wasn't it some, some interpretation of Scripture that got you where you are today anyway? You see what I'm saying? Most of us did not arrive where we are today through studying rabbinical you know, or, or the early church fathers. Now, some of us are, are now learning that we can supplement our understanding with these things. There's no question about it. And like I say, the, the, the Michael Hardens and the Andre Rabes and the, you know, of the world and the Baxter Krugers that really have the theological background to talk about the things we talk about here, you know, they're, uh, they've introduced us to some other sources, some other source materials that are very valid and very good. See, so we don't want to discount these things. But we didn't get here reading the early church fathers. At least I didn't. The, the situation that I was in 40 years ago, the understanding that I had 40 years ago, did not come from early church fathers' archaeological discoveries. In fact, I had been taught in evangelical Christianity to discount those things because those came, things didn't necessarily agree with the Scripture. Right. Right? right? You know what I'm saying, don't you? All right, so... <clears throat> The scriptures, you all know this, the scriptures are being subjected to great scrutiny with regard to, now listen to me carefully, with regard to inerrancy, infallibility, you know, and the divine uh, inspiration of every jot and tittle contained within the Genesis to Revelation volume that we have, right? They're coming under great scrutiny. But here's the thing I want to make clear to you, particularly regarding myself and other people that we have speak in this fellowship and so on and so forth. These things are not being placed under scrutiny by people who want to discredit the scriptures. You know what I'm saying? These are not people who want to discredit the scriptures. These are people who want to actually discover (laughs) what the scriptures really do have to say and to validate the true message all the more. And I don't know about what what experience you've had as you've been with us and been with the many speakers that we have brought in from you know around the world to speak here but uh I, but i believe in my own heart the scriptures have become even more validated by the things that i've discovered in my own experience to be scriptural misinterpretation so in other words we're not saying when we talk about inerrancy infallibility divine inspiration we're not trying to get people to discard or discredit the scriptures what we're trying to do is is get to the bottom of it so that we can actually, you know, validate the message even more. And uh, hopefully that's what it does for you, you know. Now, so, but why is it that the scriptures are coming under this critical examination? Well, I believe, by the people that I've described, I believe it's because of what all interpretation finally leads to. What does all in final, uh, interpretation of Scripture finally, ultimately lead to? Man's understanding of God and how he deals with humanity and the cosmos. Is it really that kind of the bottom line? That's what all, the, all interpretation of Scripture uh, uh, leads to that. And so that's why I believe that the Scripture is coming under, you know, this, this critical... Uh, this, this, this criticism that is coming under right now, and when I say criticism there, I don't mean, you know, a, 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 dis, a discarding or a discrediting. I mean, you know, let's, let's look at it and let's understand what's being said and what's not being said. See what I'm saying? All right, so <clears throat> now we know, and we talk about it a lot, a lot around here, that misinterpretation of biblical passages has led to, to slander of the person and the characteristics of Abba. Isn't that right? We know that, which inevitably which inevitably reveals itself in in both the identity and the expression of humanity. We've been talking about that. In other words, the God you believe in is the God you reflect, right? The the, the description or the definition of the image of God that you contain in you will be reflected. It will be spoken across pulpits. It will be the message that you give to your neighbor. See, how you approach the LGBT uh, community, how you approach politics, how you approach uh, violence, how you approach all of these things will be a reflection of the God that you have imagined within you. And I'm not talking about imagining God like, you know, imagine there's no heaven, imagine, you know, 
John Lennon's thing. We're not talking about that. We're just talking about the God that you have developed an image of within you. Okay? Now, now here's what we're seeing today. We're seeing today, and I want you to try to get a hold of this. That's why I had this left up here, and I'll refer to this in just a moment. But we're seeing today a fresh assumption of the nature of God being placed under the microscope and subsequently revealing a new understanding of scriptures. In other words, instead of the scripture now defining God for us, we are allowing the Father to define the scriptures. And this amazed me. When you speak and when you move, when you do what only you can do, it changes us. When you do, it changes us. It changes what we what? See and what we seek. When you come in the room, that's not talking about this room. That's talking about your inner room. That's talking about your inner room, the room that Jesus told us to go into and to pray to the Father who was in secret and the Father who lived in secret, you see? Okay, he said, when you come in the room, when you do what only you can do, it changes us. It changes what we see. It changes what we seek. You're changing everything. You see, this is what's happening. We have so long confined God to the book and said the book tells us who you are rather than you tell us what the book means. I love the book. All of you who love the book have struggled with some of these criticisms of the book. I love the book. The book means more to me now than it did 20 years ago before I began to question what I believed and why I did the things I do. Yeah. See what I'm saying? But I want to tell you what happens. You see, let me, give me, a, let me give you a familiar circumstance here. You know, when you speak and when you move, 1975, speaking to a guy who knew very little of the scripture. If you go out to the van and pray for that little girl, I'll heal her. You all know the testimony of Michelle's healing. It changes us. It changes what we see. It changes what we see, and it changes what we seek. And I'm going to tell you, from that day on, Marilyn and I had a new, <laughs> had, had an assumption. Let me put it this way. We had a fresh assumption of the nature of God. And that nature of God was placed under the microscope, and as it was placed under our microscope and remains there to this day because there's so much to be seen, see, we have allowed that image under the microscope to define Scripture for us rather than allowing Scripture to define God. Well, put up that next, what was the next line that I, I forgot what it said there that I wanted to talk about too? We're leaning in to all you are, spirit of the living God. Scriptures of the li living God. Scriptures of the living God. We're leaning in to all. No, it doesn't say that, does it? It says spirit of the living God. Come now and breathe upon our hearts. Come now and have your way. Now, I know that this, I might seem to be, you know, coming in the face of those who are such uh, profound literary expositors of the scripture, you know, and I'm not trying to do that at all. There's a balance here, but what I want you to do is, like I said, I love the book. <laughs> I'm in the book all the time. I'm in the book. I love the book, okay? But the book doesn't say to me what the book said to me 40 years ago. Right. See what I'm saying? Right. Why? Because he has come into the room, and when he came into the room, it changed things. When he spoke, it changed things. First time I ever heard the voice of God in a sense that I understood it was the voice of God was when I walked by this beautiful woman standing in the church and he told me, that's your new wife. <laughs> now she's my older wife, but she was my new wife then. <laughs> but you know what? It changed things. It changed things. I had children with, that had no mother. I was raising children alone. I was frustrated. I was desperate and I was incapable as a, as a mother-father combination. And it changed things. See what I'm saying? And again, I'm not one who believes that, you know, we're supposed to go around all the time saying, the Lord said, the Lord said, the Lord said, the Lord said, and then abusing Scripture either. That's not me at all. Never has been, never will be. But I just want you to understand what's happening today. So now we have happening all over the world, not at, not at Father's house, not just at Father's house, all over the world, and it's creating for many people, maybe some of you, some turbulence. Some, some difficulties because 
what it might be doing to some of you is asking you why you believe what you believe or why you have believed what you believe and why the hell you do what you're doing. Why we practice what we practice. Now, are we trying to throw out all of the, you know, all of the uh, things of the church? No, not at all. That's not what it is about. But what we want to do is participate in these things from a definition that has been defined for us by the Father. Isn't that right? Look at, look at John chapter 5 with me, verse 39 and 40. Most of you know this, I'm sure. Now, this is one we're going to come back to later in a later lesson. Uh, and so I'm going to use it today kind of to, ver- to, to solidify what I'm saying here. <clears throat> Jesus said, you search the scriptures. For in them you think, you think, you think you have eternal life. You think you have the answers in scripture. You think you have all the revelation you need in the scripture. These are the, the they, and these are they which testify of me. But you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. Now think about what this says. Here's what this says. This says, now this is Jesus speaking, but we're, you know, right now we're really focusing on Abba, the Father, okay? But this is what Jesus is saying. He's saying, if you don't begin with me, you'll misinterpret the very scriptures that you're searching to try to discover me. Is that right? That's what Jesus said. Do you think he was trying to point us to something that would, be, uh, you, that would be meaningful to us in our understanding of the Father? You think we could say in that, you know, you search the scriptures because you think in them you have a revelation of my, of my Father. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And these are they which testify to me. But you're not willing to come to the Father that you may have life. See, he's saying if you don't begin with me, and again, I got to tell you, I mean, and, and, and really a lot of people that have now become totally enslaved by the inerrancy, the, the infallibility, the, the, the divine inspiration of every jot and tittle began their inquiry because of a direct intervention or a direct and an, an initiated, <laughs> con, uh, uh, I'll say conflict with God. I mean, most of the people that you've listened to growing up talk about their initial contact with God, and it was almost always something that drew them out of their complacency or their understanding. You know what I'm saying? And that's probably true of most of you. Isn't that right? So we want to understand that, uh, and as I said to you once before, if you go through the Scriptures carefully, beginning with Adam and then Cain and then right on down up to Saul of Tarsus and some others, you see, you find out that God is always the initiator. But we have turned the thing over after we have gotten used to his, after we have allowed his initial initiation to begin to turn us, we have turned so many times back to the fact that man must now initiate everything. No, that's not the way it is at all. God is the initiator. Jesus Christ is the initiator. We wouldn't have all these wonderful books that we have uh, that have been accredited to the Apostle Paul had not Jesus initiated something on the Damascus Road. We wouldn't have a, 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 a Hebrew Old Testament had God not initiated something in Ur of the Chaldees with a man named Abraham. Had God not followed up that initiation, you know, with a, with a, with a burning bush in the, in, in the uh, wilderness. You see what I'm saying? There's an initiation of God that has brought us to the point where we are now hearing God within. That's why we say, you know, this message that we're being confronted with, uh, the the thing I have heard the most often from people is how this message, not my messages, but you know, the message overall resonates within them. And how the message that most of us had in our Catholic, evangelical, fundamentalist, whatever, Mormon, Jehovah's, whatever our background, Seventh-day Adventist, whatever those backgrounds were, that message always graded against something in us. But it was all we knew. So we were bound to it, right? Okay. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> now, last week, you know, um, in, in Romans chapter 1, you know, Paul presented briefly the development uh, of the of human knowledge and understanding of God, you know, literally from the slamming of the garden gate to the manger of Bethlehem. In other words, he spoke of antiquity over in Romans chapter 1. 
And, and he talked about how the knowledge and the understanding of God became developed in the Old Testament. <clears throat> and his emphasis, as we saw, was on the degradation, you know, of, of the image and the character of the Creator in what? Through futile hearts, futile thoughts, and darkened hearts. Romans 121, I believe that is, okay? We went all through that last week as we initiated this, uh, this, this particular series. But remember this. If you were here last week, think about this. What Paul did in, in Romans chapter 1, the things that we talked about last week, <laughs> we consider that the Bible. Isn't that right? So the things that we went through as Paul talked last week to us, how about the degradation of human under, knowledge and understanding of the image and character of God, right? That was the Bible. That was the Bible telling us right there that the Old Testament, let me read it the way I wrote it, that the Old Testament exhibited corruption in its presentation of God. Think about what I just said. Romans chapter 1 tells us, for though they knew God, they did not magnify him as God, and it goes on down through all those things we talked about last week. And we regard that today as Scripture. Of course, when these guys talked about Scripture, they were referring to the Old Testament Scripture. We regard that as Scripture. We regard, that as a, as a, as a, we regard Paul as a spokesman of an errant, infallible, you know, Scripture. But if you realize what Paul was saying there, Paul was telling us that the Old Testament Scriptures contain corruption in their expression of who God was. Does that make sense to you? Go read chapter 1 if you, or, and listen to last week's message if you don't understand what I'm saying. So right there we have a strong, strong statement against the infallibility and the divine inspiration of every jot and tittle of the Scripture. All right? Now, we followed Israel, you know, through, in, through the book of Exodus. You know, we follow them into the deepest darkness, <laughs> deepest darkness of their understanding of who God was that was developed through their what? Through their compromising over and over again with these are the words we read. All the gods, other gods, their gods. Remember that? All those scriptures we looked at in the book of Exodus. Again, we looked at the book of Exodus because of the fact, uh, I mean, we could have gone throughout the whole Old Testament, and we will use more as we go in this, but we use the book of Exodus because so often the book of Exodus is considered to be a type of the Exodus of humanity as, as executed by the Lord Jesus Christ. And so using Exodus speaks to me and says to me that in the Exodus of Jesus, there still remains the danger of us embracing the images of God that are false that were so often present in the Old Testament. I believe that Paul was speaking not just to, to tell us, give us history or give us antiquity or tell us how people fell into the darkness, but to also help us not to fall into that same darkness. I fear, lest as the, as, uh, the serpent deceive Eve by his craftiness, that your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity, the singleness, the union, the oneness that is yours in Christ Jesus, right? See, he, so he was speaking futuristically. He was speaking to, to a need in every believer's life. So, so even though we have indeed been, been blessed by the exodus of humanity as demonstrated or revealed through the cross of Jesus Christ, we need to understand that down through the ages, it's very possible that we have, Im, have, have exalted God among the gods, like Moses said, now I know that you are the greatest among the gods. No, Jethro said that, uh, that, that we have, have, have developed an image of God that is similar to other gods, all the gods, among the gods. See, all those terms we saw. So it's possible that that has happened. It's not just possible. <laughs> it suggests the probability. That's what this Reformation is all about. I hope you're understanding this. All right, so <clears throat> now Israel... As I told you last week, they embraced this practice throughout their history. In fact, this, to me, is one of the main storylines of the Old Testament. This, this, this embracing of other gods and this worship and servitude to other gods. 
Remember it said they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator? And I told you that word served there is not a good word. It's not a word like I might serve my wife or she might serve me. It's a word that means to be enslaved or to become subservient to. And what it's saying is that Israel became subservient to the images of other gods. They became enslaved by those things. Those same things enslave the body of Christ today, many of them. Say those same ideas. Now, we know, Paul said, which are not gods at all. We know they're not gods, okay? But, you know, by the evidence in the church today, the gods must be crazy. Yes. The gods must be crazy. All you have to do if you, as I said in my statement on Facebook last night, all you have to do if you are, if you are not sure about the mental state of the gods that we serve is look around us <laughs> at, the, at the evil we uh, we. Uh, Put on one another in life. Where did we get that? Well, we, that's part of what we're talking about in this series. So anyway, <clears throat> so as I said, you know, Israel continued this practice throughout their history, and it's recorded in literally, or not literally, but virtually every single book of the Old Testament many, many times. 318 King James Version Old Testament references to God's plural, not possessive, God's plural and idols plural, 318. That doesn't include statements like under every green tree and on every high hill where the implication is there, but the word gods or idols are not used. The Bible is so, the Old Testament is so full of this. It's incredible, right? 318 other gods. And every time, almost every time, almost exclusively, Jehovah is revealing this to be the root cause of all of Israel's problems. Could it be speaking to us today? Hmm, I don't know, you see. The message that we are intended to get from this as we peruse the Old Testament, 1 Corinthians 10, 11, what's it say? The things that happened to Israel happened as examples for us and were written... Where? In the Old Testament scriptures, for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Right? Look at that. I quoted it almost perfect. Isn't that amazing? I don't know if I have a new word for today or not. Anyway, last week's word was fraught. If you weren't here, fraught. Anyway, <clears throat> go look it up. I forgot what it meant. <laughs> Just one of those cute words I wanted to throw out, so you thought I was one of these theologians that had all these big words, but I don't. Anyway, but so what I want to say is this, though. The, the message that we were intended, that we are intended to draw from this consistent practice of Israel in the Old Testament is the message that their slanderous reporting of God and his dealings with humanity were a result of their compromise with other gods. This is the message that we're supposed to get from this. That out of this developed a slanderous communication about who God was. Okay, got to get this. And this, this degradation and this uh, slander of the Im true image and person of Abba was was labeled for us in um, Romans chapter 1 and verse 19 as ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Meaning, let me go over this again, Tori. Meaning, not meaning behavioral, moral, and ethical failure, which, yeah, they result from what we're talking about, but that's not what that was about. Meaning the assignment by man of ungodlike characteristics to Abba, the assignment by man, the belief in man's heart of, of, of unrelatedness from God the Father. In other words, distance and separation. So what we're saying is that the unrighteousness, the ungodliness, and the unrighteousness of man means that I see God with attributes that are not God-like. They are un-God-like. Well, what is my standard supposed to be? The true God. And these things, the wrath of God, Jesus, the wrath of God revealed from heaven against all ungodlike attributes that humanity was attributing to God and against all non-relational characteristics or attitudes that man was relating to God. 
Jesus suppress, uh, was the wrath of God against that because that was suppressing the truth of God in the sense of distance and separation, unrelatedness. That makes sense to you? Yes. If I say this enough, we're going to get it. <clears throat> now, sadly, you know, the Old Testament scriptures have been... Uh, the major contributor, you know, the primary cause, you know, of the, uh, uh, of, of the many false gods that have enslaved many of our thoughts and hearts. These false gods have been proclaimed across pulpits. They've been proclaimed on TBN, CBN, all of the, 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 the television shows. We hear them proclaimed all the time. We hear that the, the false God that, uh, you know, that, that destroys people that don't agree with him. You know, abortionists and, and Muslims and, and all of these people. We have a God who has a violent response to disagreement. Right? One man went so far, and most of you heard about I'm not going to bring up a name, but one man went so far uh, to, to preach a sermon that's on YouTube about how God hates you. He preached it to his own church. God hates many of you. God is dissatisfied with many of you. If God had his way, you'd be out of here. I mean, horrible sermon. Man whose name you'd all know. But anyway, we, we hear these horrible things. You know, they've come across pulpits. But you know what? We have a, a responsibility. It's not just the guy behind the pulpit. I want you to understand that. Now, the guy behind the pulpit needs help. We all do. But to sit out here and take it all in and allow it to begin to form an image of God in you that is un-God-like, well, where are you going to get your standard? Well, some God is going to have to speak up and say, <clears throat> Let me put, slide my nature under the microscope. And as you begin to examine that, if you will be faithful to examine my nature under the microscope, it will begin to say something to you different than what you have taken from these scriptures. Amen. Yes, these scriptures have a purpose. And we'll talk about that purpose later on. Not today, but in, in the future. Yes, these scriptures are valuable. And to that degree, I could say, yeah, the scriptures were inspired of God. God wanted these things written down so that man could understand the course of events and how, but, but for the reasons that, that, that people have embraced these words, inerrant, infallible, and, and, and in, inspired, divinely inspired, those are the things that are coming under the scrutiny and the criticism of, of people who now have within them a God who has entered the room and spoken, and it has changed what we see, and it has changed what we seek. Yep. See, I no longer seek vengeance. I no longer seek retaliation. I no longer seek the death of my enemies. See what I'm saying? And yes, I did before because I saw a God. I had been presented with a God that was all those things. I read, vengeance is mine. I will repay, with the, says the Lord. And I said, go get them, God. They deserve to die. And then I read the rest of it and says, you know, God just gives them a drink if they're thirsty. He gives them food if they're hungry. <laughs> Say in Romans. Okay, but anyway, you see how the, but you see how, I mean, even in that, when we did our long series on what about the judgment of God, many of you came face to face with concepts that, that, you know, you had to do a complete turnaround. Vengeance was one of them. Wrath was another. See, they no longer say the same thing to you that they used to say. And so when we say that in it, in the gospel, in Jesus Christ, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodlikeness and unrighteousness of men that suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Now we realize that that's not God being angry with humanity. That's God in Jesus squashing all these false images of himself and revealing himself in truth through Jesus, right? That's wrath. That's what does great harm to the false gods. Isn't that right? Okay. <clears throat> and so, as I said, you know, the Old Testament, though, is, has become the primary contributor to these many false gods that have enslaved us to, you know, these, these ideas of, of retribution and violence and unforgiveness and get evenness and, and, and so on and so forth, right? And so, so, in order to refresh our personal image, our personal 
understanding, our personal expectations of God. Listen to me carefully, church. And again, see, the world either benefits or, you know, fails because of what the church shows them, right? But in order to refresh ourselves, what we've got to do is we have got to be willing. Big word. We have got to be willing to deal fearlessly and honestly with the Old Testament process. Being willing to discover why it's there, what it is, what it says, and its relevance for today. Because I agree, it has great relevance for today. And we've got to be willing at the same time to fearlessly discard what it is not, what it does not say, what is irrelevant. There was a great deal made out of Hebrews 8.13 that, that when he says anew, he makes the first obsolete. We've talked about obsolescence in the past, right? And that's what we've got to be willing to do. We've got to be willing to realize that a new revelation of God, in our minds, makes the old obsolete. It's intended to do that. Where did that obsolete one come from? I'm telling you, for most of us, it came from the Old Testament. All right? Okay. <clears throat> and listen to me. <coughs> There's no greater revelation of Old Testament relevance for, that, for us today, okay, than its disclosure of Israel's servitude to other gods. That displays for us, to me, the primary relevance of the Old Testament today. See, I no longer need the prophecies of, of a babe born in Bethlehem because he's been born. You know, I don't longer need the prophecies, you know, of the old, I mean, obviously in telling other people, I no longer need the words of the scriptures that say, I am the Lord, your healer, because he is mine. See what I'm saying? But what I need is the constant reminder <laughs> of, the, of the opportunities that always present themselves for me to begin to worship and become subservient or serve false gods. Right here, right? Okay. <clears throat> the Old Testament is about how they understood God, how their expectations of God, now listen to me carefully, <laughs> affected their reporting of God to their generations and sadly have also informed us in our Christianity. That's, the, that's one of the primary things we need to get out. The Old Testament is not a historical book in the sense of being historically accurate from Genesis through Malachi. The books aren't even in the right order in terms of when they were written. They're put together in different ways, see? Okay? We, you can't go to the Old Testament, as some people have tried to do, and tell how long the earth has been here. That's not the way the, 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 the Israelite, the Hebrew people, the people of ancient times, you, you know, brought their stories together. That wasn't even what they intended to do. So... But how, the, how their expectations of God have affected their reporting of God. Think about that. Their reporting of God. As I said, falsely informing even the church today in many ways. So again, remember, what you believe about God will determine what you believe about yourself and all of humanity in general. And therefore, <clears throat> your participation, my participation, in the dominion that we have been given over all the earth will reflect the God that you believe you have been made in the image of. Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, let them have dominion. Right? And that's exactly what we have done since the time that, that those words were uttered. We have understood an image of God. We have taken upon ourselves the likeness of that God. See, I mean, we have agreed with that likeness. And we have exercised dominion in the earth. And the best way to do that, of course, is to kill our enemies. Oh, wait a minute. Where'd we get that? Oh, well, maybe from Zeus. I don't know. You see what I'm saying? Okay. The, those of you that don't leave the church this week, <laughs> you can't go while Marilyn and I are on vacation. You have to come back afterwards. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> but anyway, this is what will determine how you live out your life. And we need to be honest with ourselves. The problems in my life, and I can just go back now. With the, I mean, I couldn't identify this years ago. 
But the, con- the, 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 uh, the problems in my life, some of, them of which I've talked about here, my anger and so on and so forth, all of those things were justified in me by what I believed about my God. He was a God that didn't, into- he, uh, that didn't tolerate insolence or, or, you know, or back talk or that kind of thing. You know? And so I didn't tolerate it. You hear what I'm saying? Now, I'm not, again, you've got to be careful how you hear these things. I'm certainly not saying that children ought to be allowed to just back talk their parents. I don't mean it like that. I understand what I'm saying. But I can look back on it now, and I can say that all of the thoughts and ideas that I had years ago all stemmed in some way from my image of who God was. Okay? <clears throat> all right, so let's go back to... Isaiah chapter 40, and let's look at a little bit of this today, <clears throat> and uh, I may go a little over time, I apologize, but I've got to get this in, so, verses 18 to 20, to whom then will you liken God, or what likeness will you compare to him? Good question. The workman molds an image, the goldsmith overspreads it with gold, the silversmith casts silver chains. Whoever is too impoverished for such a contribution chooses a tree that will not rot. He seeks for himself a skillful workman to prepare a carved image that will not totter. Now what we see in those second two verses of that three verse context there is just the development of false images in each man's circumstance and situation. Those that, are, those that, you know, he says are, are wealthy, basically. The gold, they overlay it with gold, they overlay it with silver, but some are too impoverished for that. So anyway, that's what we see. But the question is, to whom then will you liken God, or what likeness will you com- compare him? All right, and then go down to verse 25. To whom then will you liken me, or to whom shall I be equal, says the Holy One? Same question, only now it's spoken in the first person instead of by Isaiah. Whom then will you liken me? And then over to chapter 46, verse 5. To whom will you, and please, every time we read the word you, think you. Not my church, not my pastor, not my wife, not my brother. You know, you, okay? To whom then will you liken me and make me equal and compare me that we should be alike? They... Remember they, they lavish gold out of the bag and weigh silver on the scales. They hire a goldsmith and he makes it a god. They prostrate themselves, yes, they worship. They bear it on their shoulder. They carry it, set it in its place, and it stands. From its place it shall not move. (laughs) Though one cries out to it, yet it cannot answer nor save him out of his trouble. This is why Reformation questions (laughs) why we believe what we believe and why we do what we do. Look at verse 7, though. Let's talk about verse 7 in light of your New Testament faith and experience, right? Notice that they says, they says they bear it on their shoulder. Everybody look up here. What are you bearing on your shoulder? Your thoughts, your mind, right? They bear it on their shoulder. Now, now let's go ahead and talk about steadfast evangelicals and fundamentalists, which most of us have been, Okay. They set it in its place, and it stands from its place. It shall not move. No, I've been believing this since I was raised in Sunday school, and I'm not changing for you. (laughs) We bear it on our shoulders, right? (laughs) From its place, now look at this. (laughs) Read this kind of the way he's speaking it. From its place it shall not move, though one cries out to it. Yet it cannot answer, but still it doesn't move. Right? You talk about futility gone to seed, right? Nor save him out of his trouble. Wow. That resembles so many Christians today that I know. They do not like to retain God in their knowledge. Romans 1.28. We saw that last week, right? They do not like to retain God in their knowledge. In other words, the revelation of the true God. Okay? Isaiah 44, 10, let me read that to you again. I say again because if you weren't here last week, I closed with these. Who would form a God or mold an image that profits him nothing? These are strong words, aren't they? These are words that I believe the Spirit of God has been asking to the church now for generations. And finally, people are beginning to say, what would you say? Say that again. Wow. 
Is there a possibility, maybe even a probability, that I have formed an image, a formed a God and molded an image that profits me nothing? Hmm, interesting, right? You don't need to turn there. Jeremiah 2.11 says this. Has a nation changed its gods, which are not gods, by the way, he says, <laughs> but my people have changed their glory for what does not profit. Now, you remember in Romans 1.23 last week, it said they exchanged the glory of the corruptible God for an image made like incorruptible man, birds and animals and four-footed things, right? Okay. But notice that it said in Jeremiah, it says, they have exchanged their glory. The Bible tells us that we were crowned with glory and honor. His glory. So once again, this is a reference in Jeremiah to the fact that our own image of God is reflected. See? How we see God is reflected in our lives. And they've changed their glory. In other words, the glory has vanished from them. My glory has vanished because what they've done is they have exchanged it for the understanding, the revelation of other gods. Hmm. Change the glory of the incorruptible God. So the question for us is this, though. What is the story? We've looked at three statements almost identical in Isaiah here. What is the story behind Isaiah's inquisition? Well, since we're in chapter 46, we were. Let's go back to 46. Go with me just back to verse 1 where this sort of begins. I mean, obviously, one contiguous letter. But Bell... Everybody in verse 1, Bel bows down, Nebo stoops. Their idols were on the beasts and on the cattle. Your carriages were heavily loaded, a burden to the weary. The word beast is in italics, a burden to the weary. What was a burden to the weary? What was it that, that, was, uh, that, that had their carriages heavily loaded? Well, Bel bows down, Nebo stoops. Their idols were on the beasts. <laughs> And, and, on the, and on the cattle, right? So here's the thing you need to understand. First of all, Bel, B-E-L, as, as it's in here, was the principal god of the Moabites, the Ammonites, and the Babylonians. Okay? This was their principal god. Nebo was another lesser god. He was a god of literature, and uh, I can't remember the things I read, uh, the arts and stuff like that. But nevertheless, he was a god, Nebo was. Okay, now, so in other words, the thing I wanted to get, because I asked the question, what is the backstory on, these, on the Inquisition of Isaiah? So in other words, these passages that we've looked at in Isaiah are concerned, you know, with God being likened to, compared to, or considered to be equal to, in this case, Bel, Nebo, you could go on, Ashtoreth. Now, because I wasn't sure, I just printed out a little something. I'm not going to read you this. I just printed it out so that you could look at it if you wanted to. Do you realize there are 34 specifically named other gods in Scripture? I didn't realize how many there were. 34. Now, in fairness to that count, as the man who developed this said, uh, some of them may have been the same God represented by a slightly different name in a different nation. But these gods became the definition of the nation. Now, don't take this wrong when I say this. They, in the same way that the flag has become the definition of America, you know what I'm saying, or the Canadian flag or any of them. But I'm just saying, so when you talked about Bell, you know, or Nebo, you talked about, if I talked about Bell, you knew that I was either a Moabite, an Ammonite, or a Babylonian. See? Okay. Now, 34 different gods. This is the thing you need to understand. 34 specifically named. And each one of these, now listen to this carefully, because this is the testimony of Scripture, the witness of Old Testament Scripture. Each one of these 34, well, actually, I have to back off on that because some of them are mentioned uh, in Athens in chapter 17 of Acts when Paul's dealing with the Athenians. But Zeus and um, Hermes or Mercury, whatever. But, but 32 of them then, 31 of them, whatever, are in the Old Testament. But each one of these gods, plus the many others that are not named, all brought something to the table when Israel sat down to imagine their God. You understand what I'm saying? They all brought something. To, they all had something to say about who God is. Right? These people, as we're going to go on with this in a couple more weeks, but these people were... 
drawing in all the information. Because you see, let me, let me, be, let me be fair to them. They were a hungry people to know God. People that go to churches nowadays are a hungry people to know God, right? So we can be, in our minds, critical of other people who don't believe the way we do, but we're wrong to do that because we're here because we're hungry to know God. I do what I do because I'm hungry to know God, and by being put on the spot week after week after week to study for you, I'm learning to know God. So this is a selfish thing that I do to heck with you. <laughs> there, you go. there we go, yeah. No, but you see... They were hungry to know God, and they were trying to develop, you know, a, a national. Now, now you got to say, well, wow, that doesn't make any sense with God constantly telling them, don't be involved, don't be involved, don't be involved. But how difficult is that? How long have I been preaching? I've been preaching nearly 40 years, and how long have I been telling people, God is not this, and God is not that, and God is not this, and God is not that? And still some of the people, even sitting maybe here today or listening to us, on, still believe some of the things I told him years ago, God wasn't, or that other people have told him God wasn't. See what I'm saying? <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> Listen to things. I'm going to go through a few things real quickly. I'm going to wrap this up now quickly, but l l let me just read you uh, Leviticus 18.21. I'm just going to do some things. And listen, you know, like I told you, there's 318 references. I'm not going to be dealing with those at all. But I just want to give you some um, Leviticus 18.21. And you shall not let any of your descendants pass through the fire to Molech. Nor shall you profane the name of your God, I am the Lord. Now, does that say that to engage Molech was to profane the name of the Lord, right? You say that? And how were they going to engage Molech? By passing their descendants through the fire, right? Look over at chapter 20 and verse 3 of Leviticus. I will set my face against that man and will cut him off from his people because he has given some of his descendants to Molech to defile my sanctuary and profane my holy name. All I want to ask you about this is where might we, just a suggestion now, where might we have developed our belief in eternal conscious torment? Did Molech bring anything to the table when Ashtaroth and Baal and Nebo and, and, and all of the others that are listed in the Old Testament, when they all gathered around Israel to begin to give their dissertation on who God was, did Molech make a contribution? Damn right he did. Is that right? He made a contribution of damnation. Okay. Well, I mean, that's just a thought. Okay, you don't have to believe me. Go to, go to Judges chapter 2. As I used to say, you don't have to believe me. You can be wrong if you want to. But... <laughs> I don't say that anymore because I found out that a lot of times I'm wrong. Not very often, but only when Marilyn tells me I am. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Judges chapter 2, verse 12. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt, and they followed other gods from among the gods of the people who were all around them, and they bowed down to them, and they provoked the Lord to anger. That, that basic statement is repeated numerable times throughout the Old Testament. Go over to chapter 10 of Judges, verse 6. And again, I know that you've heard some of these verses in the past because some preacher told you that that television was an idol or another god. Some pre preachers have gone so far as to say that you, you, you've made a, an idol of your wife. You've made a god of your wife. Right. Yeah, I got to tell you, yeah, I have. I idolize her. Aww. I'm going on vacation with her. I got to start setting the stage for a good time. <laughs> That's not what any of the talk about gods and idols was about in the Bible. These people didn't have television. <laughs> they didn't play golf. They didn't spend week after week in front of the TV watching football. See, all of those things we've been told are gods. Now, again, as I said last week, yeah, some of those things, overindulgence can be a problem for us in anything. I agree with that. But we need to understand. All right, chapter 10 and verse 6, look what he says. Then the children of Israel, who are the children of Israel? Who are the people that are responsible for the Old Testament scriptures? The children of Israel, right? Okay. The children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they served the Baals and the Ashtoreths, the gods of Syria, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the people of Ammon, the gods of the Philistines, and they forsook the Lord and did not serve him. So there we have a whole group of gods all gathered at the table. 
informing Israel about who God was, right? Okay. Now, 2 Chronicles 28, 23. This is the last scripture we're going to look at. And I know it's late, but I want the musicians to come up here just, as I said, just as soon as I'm through with this. But 28, 23. For he, referring to Ahaz, the, the king, but for he sacrificed to the gods of Damascus which had defeated him, saying, well, because the gods of the kings of Syria helped them, I will sacrifice to them. See, they helped them. So if I sacrifice to them, they'll help me, right? Okay. That they may help me. But they were the ruin of him. Now listen to these words. And all, and of all Israel. They were the ruin of him and of all Israel. Now you could, you could take that to mean just during his reign, they were the rule of all, uh, ruin of all Israel. But if you read the rest of the Old Testament, you can't say that. You've got to come to the conclusion that these other gods that we've read about were the ruin of all Israel, right? <clears throat> all Israel. I mean, we've got to keep this. Remember, remember in the New Testament, we're always telling you all means all. Well, in the Old Testament, all means all too. Okay? All right, all means all. All right? So in what, spe- in what way specifically was all of Israel ruined? Well, Paul told us, see, as the Scripture in the New Testament revealed corruption in the Old Testament in their understanding, their expression of God, right? Paul told us how they, how it was the ruin of of all Israel. They became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened, right? right? They changed the glory of the of the corruptible God into an image made like corruptible man. Isn't that right? They exchanged the truth of God for the lie, verse 25 of Romans chapter 1, right? So let me ask you this in conclusion. Would there be any evidence of this ruin in the sacred writings of Israel? If these other gods ruined all of Israel, might there be any evidence of this ruin in the sacred writings of Israel? Is it possible Okay, would there be any influence of this ruin in the prophecies of Israel's acknowledged prophets? Think about it. Would there be any evidence? You know that I'm going, what I'm going to do is show you that there is in a couple of weeks, so you might as well say yes now. <laughs> but but I, want you to, I do want you to think for yourself. I want you to kind of reason through some things and realize what we've been told by Paul. We've been told by Paul that there was ruin in all of Israel, even though he didn't say it that way. We've been told by Paul that that, that what Israel experienced, see, was evidenced in all of Israel, which means the good guys in Israel. Just like, listen to me, just like there is evidence of ruin in every man, woman, and child in the Christian church today in some way in what we believe. As I've told you many times, you know, at least 30% of everything I tell you from the pulpit has the potential to be wrong. I just don't know what 30% it is or I wouldn't deliver it. <laughs> that makes sense? Absolutely. I mean, all you got to do is go back 15 years and listen to my teachings. Actually, you may just have to go back three or four weeks. I don't know. <laughs> but as soon as I discover it, I will tell you about it. But we're going to go from there the next time. You get anything out of that? <laughs>